Y'all go ahead and pull out your Bibles with me. Let's get in God's Word together uh, for just a little while this morning. We're going to be in John chapter 19, uh, verse 30. And uh, I'm going to take a few minutes uh, for us to get into that verse together this morning. And uh, then we're going to have another worship set at the end. Uh, we're going to sing a few more songs together before we, uh, before we go this morning. But we're going to be in John chapter 19, verse 30. Uh, while the kids are still making their way out, let me kind of bring you up to speed. Uh, you may be here for the first time uh, this summer, maybe the first time ever, and we're glad you're here to worship with us. Um, but we have been in this uh, series this summer called The Radical Sayings of Jesus, and I won't recap all of that, but we have gone over some things that Jesus said uh, that really go against the grain of culture. Uh, one of those, uh, I keep giving this example, one of those is that Jesus said, love your enemies. Uh, that's hard for us to do. The natural thing for us to do is to love people who love us back. Uh, but Jesus said, love your enemies. Uh, Jesus also said to serve others. Uh, it's, it's the natural tendency for us to want to be served, to, uh, to, to, to be served in life. But Jesus said that our goal should be to serve other people. Jesus came as a servant. Jesus was a foot washer. Jesus washed the, the feet of the disciples. This morning, uh, we're in John chapter 19, verse 30. And I told you earlier that I think this is the most profound thing that Jesus ever said. It's something only Jesus Christ could say uh, in complete truth. He said in John chapter 19, verse 30, it says, when he had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished, and he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. Now, I want you to go with me into a, a bit of a reality this morning. We live our lives with a lot of incompletion, don't we? I mean, we, we really do. F for us to be able to say something, that it, that to be able to say that something is completely finished in our lives is really pretty rare. Uh, there's always something that we still could have done, isn't there? Always something that we could have done better. There's always something that we could add to it or something else that we could do to make it more complete. Um, and, and I realize this, while some people are better at finishing things that they start than other people are, I think it would be at least fair for us to say that we all have our instances where our good intentions outweighed our resolve to actually finish the task. You see where I'm going? I mean, we, we've all been there. We all know what it's like, don't we? We all have unfinished things in our lives. We all have the half-mowed lawn, don't we? We all have the half-read book. We all have the letter that we started but we never sent in the mail or the email, we, we all, here's, here's, the, here's the convicting one, we all have the abandoned diet, don't we? We, we, all, we, you know, people have the degree they never finished, the phone calls that they never returned. And let's get a little bit deeper here. You see it in, in big life scenarios, incompletion, abandoned child, jobs that are quit, a divorce, bills that are never paid, promises that are never kept. And, and let's just be real truthful. Um, you know, I, and I, I, don't wanna, I don't want this to be kind of a, a downer sermon this morning, and I, and, I, and I don't really desire to start off on a negative note. And, I, and I'm not saying any of this to say that we are incomplete people purposely to make, us try to, to make us feel like failures. I'm not trying to do that, but we have to go into this verse this morning where Jesus said it is finished with a clear theological understanding of our humanity and of God's holiness. See, we are fallible human beings, aren't we? We all fall short. We mess up. We make mistakes. We sin. We fall short. We often don't finish. I've said it, I've said it before that when you die, that the dash on your grave marker between the year that you were born and the year that you die needs to mean something that's going to last for all of eternity. Our short lives here on this earth need to be filled with eternal things that matter, don't they? Yes. And so the big question becomes this morning, is your life surrendered to Christ? We, we begin to ask ourselves, what is filling the dash in between the year we're born and the year we die. We, we need to live our lives to the fullest for Christ, don't we, when it's all said and done. That's, that's what we're supposed to do. That's why we were created, but here's the deal. Not one of us will ever, ever, ever be able to say, even if we run the race well, 
Okay, and I don't want you to misunderstand me. Even if we run the race well, which is what we're supposed to be doing, Paul told us to do that. Paul said in 2 Timothy 4, 7, he said, I fought the good fight, I finished the race, I've kept the faith. As growing believers, we're supposed to do that. We're supposed to be running that race well so that we finish well, but none of us, none of us, even the most devout disciples, the, folk, the folks that walk the closest with Christ, not even Paul, could say, I did it perfectly. He, he said he finished the race. He said he kept the faith. He said he fought the good fight. That's awesome, but Paul, not even Paul could say, I had no missed opportunities. Not, not even Paul could say, I did everything that the Father wanted me to do. Paul, Paul could never say, I finished every single thing I set out to do. Paul was a saving sinner. Uh, he was a saved sinner, uh, saved by grace. We are fallen, we are sinners. We, we'll never get it all done, will we? Many things go unfinished in our lives. There's always unfinished business with human beings. I, I found a great example of it this week. It's a, it's a little known fact that um, th this was pretty cool to me. I, I didn't know this, um, and I'm a history major, but I did not, I did not know this. I, it's a little known fact that Mount Rushmore has never been finished. If you study the faces of the presidents on Mount Rushmore very carefully, you'll notice that the sculptor uh, finished more of the work on George Washington than he did on the other presidents. And he originally planned to extend the figures of, of each of the presidents down into the chest area, but he didn't live long enough to see his dream come to fruition. His, he, he died. His son continued the work for a few months after his death, but then he ran out of money. And it's been years since, and millions and millions of tourists have gone to Mount Rushmore, but Ra Mount Rushmore, for all of its grandeur, um, is still an unfinished work of art. And it just reminded me that we all have unfinished things. We all have that light that still needs to be fixed. I've got one in my bathroom closet right now that needs to be fixed. We all have those rooms that need to be painted. I've got a basement that I've been meaning to paint for the last seven years. We, um, we all have that phone call that we should have made. We all have that conversation that we've been meaning to have with someone. And I, I, that, hopefully I'm making the point about our humanity, and that's enough about us. But let's talk about Jesus Christ for just a minute. Only one person in history never left behind any unfinished business. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the, he's the only person who could come to the end of his life and say with absolute and with total truthfulness, I have finished everything that I set out to do. Now, I want you to go with me into the context real quickly this morning of John chapter 19. It, it's Friday. Get it in your mind's eye. It's Friday in Jerusalem. There's a huge crowd gathered at a place called Skull Hill. John chapter 19, verse 17. Uh, Skull Hill was on the north side of the city of Jerusalem. It's just outside what's called the Damascus Gate. It's located by the side of, uh, of a very well-traveled road. The Romans... Uh, held crucifixions pretty often, and they liked to hold their crucifixions in public places. Kill, here's, here's the deal. Killing people in public was almost like a game to the, to the Roman government. This particular crucifixion, crucifixion that day started at 9 a.m. For three hours, everything proceeded as normally, and then the Bible tells us that ex at exactly 12 noon that the sky went black. It's not overcast, but get it in your mind, it's pitch black. Not even, not even like it is at night when you have the, the shine of the moon or the, or the stars. It's pitch black. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. For three hours, darkness fell on the city of Jerusalem, utter darkness. And then just as suddenly as it started, the Bible tells us that the darkness lifted. And Jesus Christ, our Savior, would not last much longer. The Bible tells us that his body quivered uncontrollably. His, I imagine that his chest was heaving with every tortured breath. Probably the closest thing that we've seen might have been that movie that came out, The Passion of the Christ, and I don't even know if it does it justice. The soldiers knew from long experience that, that, that Jesus was not going to make it until sundown. And then it happened, if you read in Matthew's writings, in, in, the, in the Gospel of Matthew, 
You see that in the crucifixion story that it tells us that Jesus shouted something. He shouted, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And as the moments passed, and, and the Bible tells us as his death drew near, he let out a hoarse whisper, and he said, I thirst. He said, I thirst. And, and the soldiers put some sour vinegar on a sponge, and they lifted it up to his lips on a stalk of his, with a stalk of hyssop, and he, he moistened his lips, and, and, he, and he took a deep breath. And, and if you could listen, if you could hear the death rattling in his throat, he, he had less than a minute to live, and then he spoke again. It was a quick shout. It was one word in Greek. If, you, if you're paying attention, you would miss it in all the confusion. He breathed out this last word, and then he was dead. Now, what was that last word he spoke? In the Greek, it was one word. It's called tetelestai, T-E-T-E-L-E-S-T-A-I. -E -E it's tetelestai. In English, it's three words. It is what we call, it is finished. He said, to tell us die, it is finished. Now, what was finished? When we say it is finished, what do we mean by that? I mean, you know, we, I, don't think, I don't know if we completely understand that. When we, say we, when we say we are finished, there still may be three or four fries and some corn left on the plate, and we scrape it into the garbage can, and we're finished with dinner. When Jesus Christ said to tell us to die, or it is finished, it meant that all the work was complete for sinful human beings to be reconciled to God. Everything that needed to be done had been done by Jesus, and now all Jesus had to do was die and rise again, which only he could do. And with that, all that's left for people to do is to repent of their sin and turn to Jesus Christ for salvation, the only way, the only hope. A.W. Pink said that, in that word, to tell us die, is wrapped up the gospel of God, all assurance and the sum of all joy. Charles Spurgeon said, we would need all the other words that ever were spoken or ever can be spoken to explain this one word. It is altogether immeasurable, finished. It was a conqueror's cry. It was uttered with a loud voice. There is nothing of anguish about it. There is no wailing in it. It is the cry of one who has completed a tremendous labor and is about to die. And before he utters his death prayer, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. He shouts his life's last hymn in one word, to tell us die. Now the word to tell us die comes from the verb to leo, which means to bring an end, to complete, to accomplish. It's a crucial word because it's, it uh, signifies the successful end to a particular course of action. It was done. It was finished. It's the, it's, it's the kind of word that you would use when you climb to the peak of Mount Everest and there's nowhere else to go. It's the kind of word that you would use. Uh, I'm working on my doctorate right now. It's the kind of word I'm going to use when I turn in my dissertation and there's not another word to write. It's the word you would use when you make the, the, the final payment on your, on your house, and it's, and it's done. It's the word you would use when you cross the, the finish line of the first 5K that you've ever run, and you finally did it. There's no more race left to run in that race. The word means more than I just survived. It means I set out to do and I accomplished exactly what I set out to do. But there's more to the word to tell us die than that. It's, here's what's interesting. This is really cool. Y'all with me for a second? To tell us die is a word that in the Greek was written in the perfect tense. It's significant because in the perfect tense it speaks of an action which has been completed in the past with results that continue into the present and with a finish that will never be undone and will always be. It's pretty cool. Uh, from, it, it looks back on that past event and it says this happened, and in the perfect tense it adds this idea that this happened and is still in effect today. It tells me that Jesus Christ is not washed up, that he wasn't just some figurehead 2,000 years ago, wasn't just some prophet, but he's the, he's the Lord of all, and that what he did lasts forever, it's eternal. 
that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word always will be. When Jesus cried out, it is finished, he meant it's finished in the past, it's still finished in the present, and it will remain finished forever. Here's another cool thing. Jesus never said, I am finished. He didn't say that. He said, it is finished. He said, I, com I completely and totally finished the work that I came to do. Now, theologically, what do we need to understand was finished? Number one, well, his enemies were finished. By nailing him to the cross, they had done their worst. They did all they could ever do to Jesus. He was going to rise again. They did all they could do. Two, he, he, his sufferings that were ordained by God were finished. We, we need to never forget that God ordained that Christ should die. It wasn't that, that human beings overpowered God and, and, just, and just took him from God, but God ordained from the beginning of time. He knew that mankind would sin and there had to be a perfect sacrifice for sin. God ordained that he would die on the cross. The, the third thing is that the Old Testament prophecies were fulfilled. This is really cool. He, the, the Bible told us in the Old Testament, Psalm 69, that he would be given vinegar to drink. Zechariah chapter 11 tells us that he'd be sold for 30 pieces of silver. That's exactly what happened. Psalm 22 says his hands and feet would be pierced. That's exactly what happened. Psalm 22 also says that his garments would be divided. That's what the Roman soldiers did. Zechariah 12 says his side would be pierced. That's what happened. Many other prophecies surrounding his death. And all those were fulfilled or would very soon be fulfilled at the time of the scripture. Number four, the ceremonial law was abolished. I shared that with you earlier, that in the Old Testament times, there had to be sacrifice after sacrifice for sin. Animal offering after animal offering. Romans 10.4 puts it that Christ was the end of the law for ceremonial washing of sin. He was the final sacrifice. It, it's like this in the Old Testament. Sacrifices were made through the blood of bulls and goats, and it was, like, it was almost kind of like making a payment with a credit card. You go shopping with your credit card for a new TV. You go to the counter. They swipe your credit card. They let you take the TV home. It's now yours. It belongs to you in a very real way, but only as long as you are good to make the payment when the bill comes. Charging a credit card is not making a real payment. It's just a picture of a payment that's valid only if you make good on that payment at a future date, right? Every time God's people would make a sacrifice for their sins, it was like taking a credit card, making a charge against God's account. Just like a credit card, the, the blood of bulls and goats was, was not an actual payment. Just as with a credit card purchase, you, you, you take the TV home, you're, it, so too were your sins forgiven, but it all depended on God paying the bill later. And aren't you glad that God paid the bill later? God kept His promise to make the real payment. He put Jesus forward as the payment. Propitiation, it means satisfying the demand of a payment, and that's what God did. The propitiation was Jesus' blood, the only blood that could pay for the sin. The price of sin was paid in full. You remember the words of John the Baptist when he saw Jesus, he called him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In John chapter 1, verse 29. And that taking away of sin was accomplished only by the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. What else? His physical sufferings were at an end. As he said, as he said, to tell us die, it is finished. His physical sufferings were over. The storm was over. The worst was past. All his pains, his agonies are at an end. And the work of redemption was now complete. This undoubtedly to me is the major meaning of all of it. The work of redemption was complete. That's what is amazing about what Jesus said. The, the word to tell us die was used in first and second centuries in the sense of fulfilling or paying a debt that often appeared, appeared on receipts. It is finished. It, it's also interpreted, get this, it is finished was also interpreted paid in full. Paid in full. Paid in full means that once a thing is paid for, you never have to pay for it again, right? In fact, paid in full means that once a thing is paid for, it would be foolish to try to pay for it again. During the time of Jesus, if you incurred a debt that you couldn't pay back, you were thrown into what was called a debtor's prison. And they would write down a list of all of your debts, and you would have to stay in prison until it was fully paid off. But how could you do this? You couldn't pay, pay it off 
while you were not able to be free and able to work? How were you supposed to do it while you were in prison? That's a big question. The only way you could get out of debtor's prison was if somebody else came on your behalf and paid your debt for you. After paying them off, they would take the list with all your debts and write a single word across it. And guess what that word was? To tell us die. They would write to tell us die, debt paid in full. Essentially, they were saying, here's your freedom. Not only that, here's your safety. You don't deserve it, but keep this receipt. It's your ticket to freedom. No one can ever accuse you of these same debts again. Here's the deal. Since Jesus Christ paid our debt in full, all efforts for us to add anything to what Christ has done on the cross is futile, isn't it? Salvation has been accomplished solely through the shed blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. You and I can't add anything of value to what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Let me put it very simply. Jesus Christ paid it all so that we don't have to. If you try to pay for your salvation, it means you don't think that he paid it all. There's no middle ground between the two propositions. God's not trying to sell us salvation. He's not offering us salvation at half price. He's not offering to go Dutch treat with us. He does some and we do some. He's not offering salvation on some kind of installment plan. God's offering salvation free of charge. That's what tetelestai means. Jesus paid in full so that we wouldn't have to pay anything, even though we deserve to have to. All was done when Jesus cried out, it is finished. It was finished then. It's finished now. And to the glory of God, after a million, trillion, bazillion years, it'll still be finished. Amen. Thanks be to God that Jesus left behind no unfinished business that he could say to tell us that it is finished in a way that we never could. He finished what he came to do. And in finishing his work, he paid the price for our sins. We're going to worship together. We're going to sing a few songs as we end. Hey, I preach short today. Amen? <laughs> Amen. Amen, right? Um, we're going to sing a few songs. We're going to worship together this morning. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, just know that it is finished, that it, to tell us die. Jesus Christ died as a ransom for your sins, that you can give your life to him and you can trust in him, okay?